record. All right, so uh, today, uh, this is a repeat class from this morning, uh, same as the uh, eight o'clock class, uh, because we have two halves of the class. First half this morning at eight, and second half of the class today at 11. All right, so confined space. Um, why do we need to know that uh, this, uh, why, why do we need to introduce you to this topic, you're going to find yourself in um, different situations as you go along when you find your job. And uh, you might, um, well, there are two reasons why I'm giving you this. One is that uh, if it is a defined uh, situation that um, that is going to be established that you are working within a confined space, then you're going to undergo different uh, official procedures on how to deal with uh, with this topic at hand. However, uh, sometimes you might run into a situation that, uh, well, let's say somebody sends you for a service call or an installation of certain kind. And uh, you're going to notice elements of confined space, uh, and this would be your cue to react. Uh, so you like stop here for a second, guys. Make a phone call to whoever sent you the, your, your office or whatever, uh, and say, so "Did you know that the site that you have sent me uh, this should be considered confined space? Uh, so uh, now it's your move." Right. And uh, as we go along, uh, you're going to find out uh, why um, you need to know things like that. Basically, um, well, if you don't deal with the confined space, workspace, uh, appropriately, uh, there's a chance that you are going, well, chance, there is a, there is a, well, yeah, there's a sort of like a you know, negative, in a negative way, chance. Uh, that you might get injured or uh, even worse. Uh, things can escalate uh, with confined space. Things can escalate, um, well, it could be a split second. And uh, before that split second, you exist in this world. And after that split second, uh, there's no you. All right? So it's important to know things like that. All right, so confined space. First thing uh, we're going to, Uh, before uh, there's going to be a little bit of reading uh, or um, analyzing some of the texts. Uh, it's one of these classes, all right? So just bear with that. Uh, it's all important, all right? Now, this is a picture. I put this picture before the next slide uh, because uh, just so you get the visuals of what is what. So what do we have on this picture? We have um, we have a bunch of containers that are part of the hopper, and this is the hopper right here. Uh, let me uh, just here get a better pointer. Here is the hopper uh, of the uh, of the whole system, uh, and on top of the hopper you get something like that's called a catwalk. Now, what's a hopper here? This will be a container containing um, well grains or sand or some sort of solid materials. Uh, of this kind and over here you have like a funnel shaped kind of an outlet right there and uh, well on the bottom right underneath that uh, you will have either some truck loads ca trucks coming up with their uh, with their loaders or, um, or containers uh, or it could be like for example here you could see this some kind of a huge conveyor belt so whatever is in that con uh, container is dumped uh, in a controlled way onto whatever needs to be loaded onto and on top of that here's something that's called a catwalk is this for the neighborhood cats to jump up and uh, wander about no this this is called a catwalk um, it's also used in the theatrical um, terminology, uh, theater terminology. This is the uh, this is the kind of a walk above the stage and above the public, so you could walk from the back of the room to the front of the room above everything. Uh, so um, this catwalk here is it's a work uh, working or walking space with uh, provided with rails and uh, whatever necessary um, protective equipment there. All right uh, now, mm, so here is the uh, here's the scenario for that, and now we have a case study. All right, so what happens here? Let's just uh, let's just uh, analyze uh, this uh, case study here. 
while workers were uploading sand from a cement mixing hopper. Right? So cement could be also there too, right? Uh, the material became stuck and stopped dumping from the container. So whatever was coming out from the bottom here, uh, it stopped coming up, coming out. So something got stuck. All right. All right. A worker walked along nearby catwalk with a seven foot pole intending to dislodge the sand. Basically, he was trying to get things unstuck. Once the worker was near the hopper, he was out of the view of the other employees. All right. All right. No, so far, so good, or not so good. Uh, the, top, uh, the top of the hopper was open, and while there was no designated entry point, the hopper was accessible from the catwalk. Right? So things were not secured properly. While the top hopper was open, there was no any additional protection from people uh, falling in to that hopper. At some point, the worker entered the hopper. So the worker has entered that hopper. Uh, because no one could see him, no one knows whether he accidentally slipped or if he entered the hopper voluntarily. When the sand became dislodged again and began moving again, co-workers saw the seven-foot pole fall out of the bottom of the hopper with the sand. So things started moving again, but uh, something strange happened. The, the, uh, the, 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 the stick that the, the, the worker was carrying also fell out there, right? Now, the employees were unable to locate the worker on site and realized he must have fallen into the hopper. Eventually, rescuers extracted the worker from the bottom of the hopper and administered CPR. But unfortunately, unfortunately, he succumbed to the injuries uh, a short time later. So this was a fatal accident or fatal occurrence uh, that somebody actually has died because of that. All right. So here's the case study. What's what is the takeaway from the case study? The worker entered the hopper without uh, confined space. The S should not be here. Right? So the worker entered the hopper without confined space plan. So this confined space plan was not there and without proper training. So he should never, he should never approach that task that uh, he, was, he was doing. The open hopper should have been guarded or sealed to prevent unauthorized accidental entry or accidental entry. A simple grade or another barricade over the hopper could have prevented this death. Right. So here's the kind of a pre-word to something that we're going to analyze, which is we're still talking about something that's called confined space. What is a confined space? A confined space is, and I'm going to read, and sometimes I'm going to stop and explain things, all right? So a confined space is a space that is large enough for a person to enter and work. Okay. Has limited or restricted means of entry and exit. And it is not designed for continuous occupancy. If you have an office desk job, your office would be designed for continuous occupancy. There will be a certain temperature, there will be certain lighting, there would be certain um, well safety measures if there's a need for such. Um, but an office is an office. You are okay to go there and work eight hours a day, five days a week, sometimes seven, it depends, right? A confined space, you can go there and work, but it is not designed. It's not designed for you to be there all the time. And there are sometimes in the work field, there would be spaces like that. You just need to go in somewhere to adjust something, to change something, to repair something, uh, or provide just a regular uh, ongoing maintenance. 
right? But you're not supposed to be there. That's not supposed to be your everyday type of work. All right, now here are some legal regulations. All right, here's Ontario Regulation 632 uh, over one, over uh, five, zero five, okay? Now, defined it, which we the confined space, as, according to Ontario regulations, a confined space means a fully or partially enclosed space and their conditions that is not both designed and constructed for continuous human occupancy and in which atmospheric hazards might occur because of its condition, location, or contents, or because of work that is done in it. So that's enclosed in basically the couple sentences here. You might want to read that a few times just to get the gist of that, right? All right, now, then we have something that's called a permit required confined space. Mind you that in order to enter any confined space, I would say 99.9% .9 you are going to require a permit to be there. A permit required confined space has at least one of the following characteristics. A permit required confined space contains or has the potential to contain hazardous atmosphere, which is basically the air that we breathe might not be suitable for humans. So you can't breathe in it. Or contains a material that has the potential to engulf an entrant. Entrant would be the person who enters and engulfing would be, well, another way would be um, drowning someone in something. You can drown in water, you can be overwhelmed and engulfed or other ways, another version drowned in, um, well, sand, grain, um, grains or, uh, you know, cement or whatever other materials that can engulf you. This person over here that entered that, well, this is another picture, but let's say it was that, he was engulfed by the cement that was inside there and the person died. Right. Or has, so this, so permanent record, so that, that or has internal configuration such, uh, such that an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated. What is a configuration? It's basically the arrangement of what's in it. It could be equipment, could be furniture, it could be some sort of whatever, whatever physical uh, arrangement of what's in it could be dangerous to you in some sort of way. Or it contains any other recognized serious safety and health hazard. Or it basically, is a, or it's any, it's it's dangerous to be there in any other way. So, if you have any of those, this would be considered a permit required confined space, which means you can't not enter that uh, that space without official documentation uh, and official permission and official procedures that have to be followed in order for anybody to basically be there in that space. Just as an example, example as I gave uh, the other guys uh, uh, at eight o'clock. Um, <clears throat> I used to work uh, well, for different communication companies uh, in the past. And I was sent for a service call and it was just a simple thing, a routine service call. Um, was it a connect uh, a new telephone line or a data line or was it a repair? I, it was some years ago, uh, uh, existing one, all right? 
Now, the person who has sent me, they have no way of, of knowing that uh, I would have to go and uh, crawl in the crawl space underneath a swimming pool. I was taken by the staff who, you know, who basically was at, uh, you know, the people who were working at the facility. Uh, and uh, they showed me, yeah, that's the place, uh, that's where the wire is running through, and uh, that's basically, yeah, okay, good luck, have fun, right? So as I entered uh, that uh, room, which was basically almost, uh, uh, well, it was close to the swimming pool, underneath the swimming pool, I smelled some strong smell of chlorine. Well, swimming pool, chlorine, yeah, there you go. Huh? Uh, and as I approached the point of entry and that would lead me underneath the swimming pool, the smell became quite overwhelming to the point that I almost felt like I'm getting my lungs burned. So I backed out, left that uh, place very quickly and I made a phone call. And I said to the, to the dispatcher who sent me there, I said, did you know that this should be actually considered a confined space because so and so and so? Well, what would be the characteristics? Well, there would be atmospheric conditions. Uh, so it could be, uh, well, you can't breathe there. So it could be considered, well, it contains potential to hazardous atmosphere. Well, there you go, that's, that, that'll be the one. You know, right? uh, so, in our, in, so in order for someone to go there, uh, you would need a, a official procedure and official and, and specific um, precautions to be taken in order to enter that and not get hurt. I could have gone in there because the person who took me to that to that uh, spot, they just, okay, here it is. Okay, I got a job to do. Thank you. Let me know when you're done. Well, then I could have entered that and I could, uh, I, I, I could be overwhelmed by the strong uh, chlorine content in, that was in the air there. And uh, I would just um, collapse and stay there. And who knows how many hours it would take for anyone to notice that, uh, well, where is this guy? Um, and I could be dead long time before that, all right? So uh, I refused to do that. And let me tell you, the person who has hired me to do the job was so glad that I refused to do that because uh, that site was visited later with, uh, with the proper uh, procedures um, in place. And it costed uh, a little bit more time, a little bit more effort, and maybe a little bit more money. But trust me, the person was so glad to have spent a little bit more money on, uh, on getting me ready properly into entering that space. He would rather do that than spend a little bit less money for the flowers on my funeral. Plus, he would be found responsible and uh, he would have to answer a lot of other questions uh, with some prosecutors and in court and all that stuff. So I want you to, even though that, uh, that you're sent someplace, you might find a situation like that. Uh, it, it is not, whatever you have to, wherever you have to work, you're not going to, it's not going to be recognized as, uh, uh, as confined space, but you should be able to tell and it's not going to be up to you what should be done. It's going to be up to other people, or maybe you're going to be in a position of determining that, who knows, as you go along with your job. Uh, so people don't get hurt, uh, and so you don't get hurt. And sometimes you're going to be sent, people will not know where they're sending you exactly. Right? Dispatchers dispatch things to places. You're the person who's going to do the work. Please recognize the hazards. All right. What is an entry permit system? So here we're talking about permit required confined space. And then we're going to next slide. We're going to analyze um, what is involved in the permit. All right. So what is an, uh, okay. There's a phone ringing. A couple of rings. Somebody answer. And I think somebody answered that. Okay. So what's involved in the permit system? An entry permit is an administrative tool, which is, you know, well, a glorified way of saying it's a specific paperwork. 
along with procedures and maybe some equipment invo involved. Yeah. So let's say an entry permit is an administrative tool used to document the completion of the hazard assessment for each confined space entry. Someone fully trained and experienced in confined space work should be should complete the entry permit. So not just anybody say, yeah, okay, there you go, you're new at the job. Uh, here's the paperwork to fill out. Uh, you know, do the best you can. You know, people's life are at stake. Then you're not going to have a situation like that. All right. So someone fully trained and experienced in confined space work should complete the entry permit. Some jurisdictions require a permit for all confined spaces. So it's a confined space. Yeah, I need a permit to enter that. Um, doesn't matter whether it's a low risk or high risk. Uh, as soon as it's defined as confined space, you need to follow the procedures in some jurisdictions. You should, you should know the laws and regulations of wherever you are uh, in the world uh, as far as um, proper procedures of doing proper jobs, right? An entry permit is required for confined spaces where the hazard and risk assessment determines that the measures to control the risk involve the following. If you need to control the, these, you need an entry permit. And what are these? Atmospheric monitor. If, you, if, you, if this space needs to, um, if someone needs to check the air, for that, uh, it, you need a permit. If it, if it needs to be isolated from other people to enter, uh, to enter, you need a permit. If it needs to be locked out, you need a permit. If it needs ventilation, you need a permit. If it needs safeguarding devices, well, that could be all kinds of things, uh, depending on the situation and if it needs respiratory protection or any other control that requires the risk assessment to be verified by a permit. What is a risk assessment and hazard? So I just jumped a couple of slides here. Just as a reminder, what is the difference between hazard and a risk? A hazard is something that can cause harm. So. Hazard is a type of danger, something that can harm you. For example, toxic gases, it's a hazard. A risk is a chance of that happening. Is it a high probability or a low probability? So risk can have levels. It could be high risk or low risk of asphyxiation, which would be uh, uh, you're no longer able to breathe because there's no air or because you're engulfed in sand and you can't breathe, right? All right. So we had that, now let's go to the next slide. Before entering a confined space, I told you it was one of those classes today, but not all, those texts should stop soon. Before entering a confined space, an entry permit should be completed. It should contain at least the following information. So different companies will have different procedures that are established by one or many meetings between people who are responsible for that, with people who are responsible for things like that. All right, so the permit should be completed and it should include this information. The length of time the permit is valid for. You can't have a blank statement. Say, here's confined space, and here's your permit to enter for the next three months as you please. It's not a driver's license. Right. right, then the name or the names of the worker or workers that are authorized to enter the confined space. The names of the attendants. So, you see, we have the people who work in there, who go to work in that space. We also have the attendants. So who will be working and who will be watching you do the work, making sure that you're safe. Did you ever watch that? Uh, well, I'm not big on the reality shows, but uh, 
some time ago there was a little bit of a show that uh, it was called uh searching for gold or something like that uh that people would just go to alaska or other places uh looking for gold right? and uh one of the programs involved go oh, gold rush thank you thank you nicholas <coughs> And one of the uh, one of the uh, shows involved uh, diving under the you know and under the wall underwater and looking for gold specks uh, on the bottom of the ocean or lake or whatever it was. And you would have the person diving, and on top would be a person monitoring the situation. So they will be talking to that person, making sure that uh, the guy on the bottom doesn't, you know, start doesn't begin to talk funny, not making sense. Maybe there's something going on, uh, or whether he's safe, or whether he's actually, you know, just maintaining contact and making sure there is enough oxygen being provided and whatnot. Right. So that person on top would be the attendant, right, and the person on the bottom would be the worker. All right, so uh, the names of the workers need to be included. Names of the attendants also must be um, included in that work. Whoever is involved in the action. Right? Uh, the location and description of the confined space. So that's pretty much given. Uh, the scope of work that needs to be done. So whenever people work in there they need to have a reason not just i know what uh, here's the you know uh, i'm just going to take a look around and get out i just want to see what's in there right no it, there's going to be a reason why you are working into that um, into that space right? and it has to be well defined described and uh, and established right? possible hazards we talked about what these are uh, possible hazards that might be encountered inside. So possible hazards. What can happen to you when you're there? It has to be defined. Possible hazards that might develop during the work activity. Uh, the time and the date and time of entry into the confined space and the anticipated time to exit. The details of any atmospheric testing done of the confined space when where the results and date of monitoring equipment was calibrated. Ideally, the calibration would have been done just before each use. If it's not possible, follow the equipment's manufacturer guidelines for frequency of calibration. So, you know, this is just so you know, like, if you are involved in that kind of operation, uh, you will have extensive and more official training specific to whatever the job is. Hazards, hazard control measures. So how can you be in control of the dangers that possibly could uh, hurt you in there? Including the use of mechanical ventilation. So that would be controlling the hazard. Uh, or uh, And other protective equipment needed and any other precautions that need to be followed by every worker who is going to enter the confined space right that has to be included in the permit also what needs to be included means of communication between the persons working in the confined space and the attendants or attendant that has to be specified how are you going to communicate with each other emergency plan and protective equipment and emergency equipment to be used by any person who takes part in a rescue. So if something happens, what is exact, what are you going to do exactly, what equipment you're going to use and what they're going to do. All right. So again, emergency plan, what are you going to do if something happens? There's no time to figure things out. Oh, uh, you know, okay, what happened? Oh, something happened to this guy that's in there. Okay, let's have a meeting. Let's see what we can do. No, if something happens, the reaction should be immediate and everybody should know what they're supposed to do. And the protective equipment and emergency equipment to be used by a person who takes part of the rescue. If you need to enter as a rescuer, what do you need to have in terms of protecting yourself? Because if you don't, there could be two people instead of one person that need help. 
uh, personal or response to uh, other emergency situations that are in the confined space. So in a nutshell, that's what it is. Uh, what, need, what else needs to be? A signature of a worker who did the confined space air testing. Whoever did the testing has to be confirmed. It has to be signed. The signature of a permit. Uh, the signature on the permit would indicate that adequate precautions are being taken to control the anticipated hazards. Well, that second sentence follows the first one, right? Authorization signature by the supervisor certifying that the space has been properly evaluated, <coughs> excuse me, prepared, and it is safe, that's a relative term, for entry and work. The entry permit should be posted at the confined space and remain so until the work is completed. The employer should keep a copy of the completed permit on file. So this one is just like, you know, things are official. All right, we already have done that slide. Now, what possible hazards can we uh, talk about when we talk about the hazards that are characteristic for the confined space? Oxygen deficiency. We're humans, we need oxygen to breathe. Flammable, combustible gases and vapors. That's a big one. These actually, the, this kind of hazard takes you by surprise. And when the surprise happens, uh, one second you exist in this world and a split second later, there is no you. There was long time ago, uh, sometime in the beginning of 90s, uh, there was on the news, uh, CFPL TV at that time, that uh, unfortunately uh, there were a couple of workers, uh, they needed to enter some sort of confined space underneath the sidewalk somewhere, there could be some gases, and there were some gases that were released that were toxic to humans, and uh, the, the gases released as soon as they opened the flap or the door or whatever that was, and they just hit them and they were so strong that those guys were dead immediately. Right? And that was big news um, here in our town. Right? Uh, <clears throat> toxic gases, so these goes, you know, engulfment in solid or liquid. Can you be engulfed in solid? Like one could be water or it could be some kind of other liquid or it could be solids, uh, grains, cement, sand, whatever else. So these are the hazards. High noise levels. Noise can also kill you. Right? Now, what else? This will be part of the configuration uh, scheme, right? So grinding, crashing, or mixing mechanisms will be part of the configuration inside that space or any other arrangement of whatever is there. Extreme temperatures. Oh. chemicals and lack of lighting. These are just, well, these are the most common ones. There could be others, right? But here's a nutshell of things. All right, here we have some pictures. We love pictures. What do we see here? Possibly you're passing on the countryside and you see those silos. What is there? That's grain. Look at this, here's a ladder thing. Well, the ladder is kind of raised. Not anybody can just walk in there, so safety is being there. So you need to uh, you know, you need some other ladder to enter this ladder, right? Um, and uh, can you walk in there? Can you fall in there? Yes, all right? So that would be a confined space. Uh, usually there will be grains inside there, so you could become engulfed uh, in something like this. Engulfed by whatever the material, the solid is, but it's a runny solid. You fall in there, things cover you pretty quickly, okay? So this would be considered a confined space. You need to, you know, uh, uh, you need specific equipment, uh, procedures. I'm not sure if this person has specific equipment. You know, he has a stick or something and he's poking something with the stick. Is this a correct procedure? I would say no. Then here, this picture is a, example of a configuration within 
with within the workspace within the confined space there's a lot of equipment that uh, moves um, in a way that you might not predict its movement there's no established ways to walk uh, without watching for some other things so you have to be trained and you have to be familiar with the room what you can do and what you're going to do to avoid that all right so this would be configuration of the room there could be some sort of things they can trip on there could be bad lighting there could be equipment that stands there that can hit you uh, there could be something that is not moving and but once in a while it moves and it can surprise you by that so this is a confined space due to configuration this one here will be an engulfment right. let's 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 take a couple of more slides here all right over here, we see something. Would that be a confined space? Yeah, well, can you be engulfed here? Well, yes, you can be engulfed by a liquid. But there's another hidden danger here. There is a fence. And the fence serves two purposes. It is certain distance from this liquid. All right. Now, this fence prevents people to kind of walk into it and fall in so that's one thing but also look at this statement right here this reserve pit is a permit required confined space because of its potential to contain hazardous atmosphere and to drown a worker so drowning would be one thing but because of its hazardous atmosphere if you're standing too close to that, you can be overwhelmed by the vapors. And then you can fall in. Or if you don't feel overwhelmed by the vapors, you can just lie down on the side. And you can still die because of the atmospheric hazard. There could be vapors that, you know what I mean, right? All right, so here's a bit of an eye opener, right? not just walking in it's what's in it there and if you get to, to uh, uh in close proximity with that it can also kill you right this is example of a permit required confined space oh well, is it a confined space sure does it look like an office with nice view no it doesn't even have a window it doesn't have ventilation it's closed can somebody enter yes maybe there's some work that is required to, to to be done periodically there just get in do something do some maintenance and get out yes so it will be considered as confined space and the statement is always follow your company's permit procedures even if you are going in for just a second that's what kills i just wanted to take a look boom and something cuts your head off. Am I joking? No, there's no time to joke here. All right, this confined space might be oxygen deficient or contain flammable, combustible, or toxic gases or vapors. Look at the mask this person is wearing. Test the atmosphere in order, in this order oxygen content and flammables then toxic then other hazards well this is just the information for you you by no means by receiving this lecture you are qualified to do any of that work usually pretty much always uh, there is no specific one type of work there will be different uh, situations and the different situations will require different procedures that are set and are specific to the place and the type of space that is involved right? and the work that you need to do it right? test the atmosphere for all levels at all levels of the confined space what does that mean good air near the opening doesn't mean there's a good air at the bottom or anywhere else things have to be truly tested now here's a bit of a visual example of a test there that uh, when you um, when you bring that little thing inside there and something is going to light up something's going to change colors 
as years go by, and it could be from one year to another, different equipment uh, can be used. Uh, different companies have different equipment. Uh, so whoever does that will have to be familiar and trained on the equipment that's being used. Please watch these two videos after you download this, and I'm not releasing that yet. Um, uh, I might release the half of that, and then half later, or maybe I release the whole thing on Friday. Okay. But once you download, watch these two videos. They are short videos that will give you a little bit more insight on what's involved in the air quality testing uh, with confined space. And some of the questions on the test might involve watching these videos. Right. Uh, next slide. Uh, the atmosphere inside a confined space might not be suitable for entry. Forced air ventilation might be used, but you are not permitted to enter until the atmosphere is suitable. Right. So that's good. Now, sometimes you're going to see uh, on the side of the road, one person digs a hole with the shovel and there's five managers standing around him. Right? Over here, you see there's uh, two, or two or three people maybe walking in and there could be a whole crew getting them ready for it. This is legit. Right? Even if the, the work that needs to be done takes very short time, well, you need the proper protective equipment and you need, sometimes you need more than one person to get you ready for that. Right? Uh, next slide. Atmospheric conditions might change while you are in a confined space. Periodically monitor the atmosphere within the confined space. Do I need to explain that? Well, maybe I do. Right? It's okay to enter now. You go there, after 10 minutes, something could change and uh, all of a sudden uh, the air is not suitable to breathe. That's why you need the person that works there and you need the attendant to constantly monitor the situation. And sometimes if the, uh, the air gets close to being bad, the attendant may say, okay, get out now. Or sometimes um, the attendant might have to pull the person out, right? depending on the situation. Get out. If hazardous atmosphere is detected while worker is in the confined space, all activities should stop. The workers should exit immediately or be pulled out. Uh, the hazard should be uh, evaluated. Protective measures should be taken. Well, there's a reason for things to exist like that. And here's a picture of person working there. And there's a picture of uh, a person that is working as an attendant. Right? Uh, here. Here, here, and this is, is this the last slide, second last slide for today. Uh, if a worker must wear a respirator, here's the thing about the mask. Now remember I showed you watch the mask that this guy is wearing, All right? So here's the statement. Uh, if a worker must wear a respirator, remember that an air purifying respirator, air purifying respirator will be just uh, maybe uh, if you're working as a drywaller and you're doing some sanding and you're going to do wear a dust mask. If there is no oxygen in the air, a dust mask will not save you. Right? So always assess the proper situation, pr uh, situation properly, right? So I'm going to read this again. If a worker must wear a respirator, remember that an air purifying respirator will not do anything will do nothing in an oxygen deficient atmosphere. These workers are wearing air supplying respirators due to the lack of oxygen. Right? And here's the last slide for today. Adequate illumination should be provided where the lighting is limited. In some cases, explosion proof lighting might be necessary. What's involved in explosion proof lighting or explosion proof anything? Well, if it's a lighting system, remember when, uh, well, if you turn lights on and off uh, in your kitchen or your living room, sometimes if you do it a certain way, if you do it too slow, you're going to notice a little bit of a spark. The spark is always there, even if you don't know that is there. So like, for example, if, uh, if you have a gas leak at your house, just get out or, uh, well, um, by no means turn things on and off because there could be enough gas in the air that if you use the light switch, 
you can cause an explosion by producing that spark. Uh, that is it for today, uh, and we're going to continue that a week from now. As a reminder, uh, this Friday, this coming Friday, I will introduce the assignment to you, and you're going to have a week to do that. And after this, we have one more topic to cover, write the test, and uh, we'll see you in another course, uh, which will be network cabling, uh, which this was this uh, this course covered most of the pre-electrical uh, or electrical systems. Uh, the other course that you're going to do this called network cabling is also going to have it with me. It has to do with the data infrastructure, so-called low voltage, but technically it should be called extra low voltage, which means signal cables, data cables. Uh, sound, uh, microphones, uh, maybe not as much, but uh, data structure for the most part. Okay, enjoy the rest of the week and always keep the attitude that it is almost Friday. Why? Because every day is almost Friday. Can't say that enough, can I? Eh? I bet you're smiling now. All right. Thank you guys and have and gals uh, have a wonderful whatever you're going to have. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>